Hey everyone, welcome to tutorial number four. So far, all the sound we've been producing is generated indefinitely until we either free the synth or press command period. But both of these options are hard stops. They release the sound instantaneously and usually produce a click. There are many cases when you'd want a synth to fade in and fade out and to free itself after the fade out is complete instead of the user having to free the synth manually. For this purpose, there are several envelope UGENs available, which we can find in the documentation by going to Browse, UGENs, and Envelopes. The term envelope, in many cases, refers to the well-known ADSR envelope, which I'll discuss later in this video, but there are many kinds of envelopes. More generally, envelope refers to a custom signal shape that controls one or more parameters of a sound. Envelopes most often control amplitude, but they can just as easily control other parameters like frequency, duty cycle, playback speed, etc. Let's start by looking at line, which is the simplest of these envelopes. Line takes a start value, an end value, and generates a signal that travels linearly from start to end over a duration given in seconds. Like almost all UGENs, line also takes an optional mull and add, and then there's an argument we haven't seen yet called done action. Done actions are found with UGENs that are inherently finite. For instance, an oscillator has no inherent endpoint, it simply generates a recurring wave shape until we tell it to stop. On the other hand, a line and other envelopes have a definitive endpoint. Therefore, when a finite UGEN is part of an active synth, SuperCollider wants to know what kind of action to take once the UGEN has finished. Done action allows the user to specify this action by supplying an integer. In the help file for line, there's a link to a reference file called UGEN Done Actions. You can also find a link to this reference file at the bottom of the UGEN category in the document browser. Here, we can see the available done actions and the integers associated with them. To be perfectly honest, although there are 15 options, the only done actions I've ever used are 0 and 2, which are do nothing and free the enclosing synth. Let's return to our line example and see how done action works. But first, to make these concepts more clear, I'll bring up a visualization of the audio server, which is actually pretty useful in many contexts. We can do this by evaluating server.local.plottree. And remember, server.local is also stored in the global variable s. In the following example, I'll control the amplitude of a pulse wave using a control rate line that goes from 1 to 0 over 1 second. I haven't specified a value for done action, so the default value 0 is used. This means SuperCollider will take no action when the line is complete. A synth appears on the visual server window when we run this code. After 1 second, the line is complete, and because we've chosen done action 0, no further action is taken by SC synth. This means that even though we don't hear anything, the synth is still running, as we can see on the visual representation, and it is outputting zeros at the audio rate, which means CPU cycles are being used. In addition to the audio server visualization, we can also see a 1S on the status bar, which means there is one synth currently active. The only way to free this synth is to do it manually with x.free or command period. Now suppose we evaluate this code several times in a row. Not only do these synths pile up on the server, but we are overwriting the global variable x with each evaluation. This means that x.free will only free the most recently created synth. If we try x.free again, SuperCollider complains that the synth we're trying to free doesn't exist anymore. So now the only option is to free everything from the server using either s.freeAll or command period. Let's do the same thing, only this time we'll specify done action 2, which means SuperCollider will automatically free the enclosing synth when the UGEN is finished. Now we can run this code as much as we like, and with each synth that's created, the server will take care of freeing it once the line is complete. In fact, we don't even really need to give this synth a name anymore. Previously, we needed to name our synth so that we could free it later, but now SuperCollider is handling that for us. 
Let's move on to x line, which is an exponential version of line, and works in very much the same way. However, it's very important to remember that it's mathematically impossible to interpolate exponentially when including or crossing zero in the output range. So even though a synth appears on the server when using an x line from one to zero, we don't hear the expected result. Instead, we need to constrain x lines start and end points to either the positive or negative domain. Notice that x line sounds a little more natural than line. This is because we perceive amplitude exponentially. We hear an amplitude of 0.5 as half as loud as 1, we hear 0.25 as half as loud as 0.5, and so on. So the exponential line makes for a nicer sounding fade. If we were using decibels, on the other hand, we'd probably want to use line, since the decibel is a linear measure of loudness. 0 dB is twice as loud as minus 6 dB, which is twice as loud as minus 12 dB, and so on. We can convert from decibels to amplitude using dB amp. Here, the line goes from normalized output down to minus 40 dB. And for those who are curious, we can convert back to decibels from amplitude using amp dB. Just to demonstrate that line and X line aren't restricted to amplitude control, let's use another X line to control the frequency of the pulse wave. Again, x line is a sensible choice because, like amplitude, we also perceive frequency exponentially. 200 hertz is an octave above 100, 400 hertz is an octave above 200, and so on. In this case, both our x lines have the same duration, so it doesn't really matter which one has done action two, as long as one of them has it. Suppose our x lines had different durations and both had done action two. In this case, whichever finishes first will free the synth. In this case, we hear that the 5 second X line doesn't have time to get all the way down to 110 Hz because the 1 second X line frees the synth after it finishes. If the rolls were reversed, then the sound stops abruptly before it has time to fade all the way out to 0 0.01. One way to fix this is to change the done action on the shorter X line to 0. or remove done action entirely, which has the same effect since the default value is zero. But now there's a different sort of problem. After one second, the amplitude envelope is still in progress, and the shorter X line gets down to 110 hertz after only one second, and then sits there for the remaining four seconds, and this may not be the sound you want. So the real solution is to conceive of all your envelope eugens together as one sound producing unit, and make sure that their durations are harmonious with one another. In other words, if you want a 10 second sound, don't put done action 2 on a 1 second eugen. Let's move on to a more sophisticated envelope generator called envgen. Envgen makes use of a class of objects called env. Env is a specification for a breakpoint envelope shape and has functionality in both the language and on the server. Also, unlike line and xline, envgen has a gate argument, which means envgen can be sustained indefinitely and can also be re-triggered. Envgen's first argument expects an instance of env, so let's take a look at that class first. The most generalized and all-purpose method for env is .new. In the language, an env can be visualized using the method plot. If we don't provide any arguments to env.new, SuperCollider uses the defaults, which results in a simple triangle envelope. The first three arguments for env.new levels, times, and curve are probably the most significant. The first argument, levels, should be an array of numbers representing ordered values that envgen will output. The default value is the array 0, 1, 0, which means the envelope signal will start at 0, rise to a value of 1, and return to 0. The second argument is an array of times. The size of this array is almost always one smaller than the levels array because the number of connecting segments is one fewer than the number of level points. In other words, if you have three level points, then there are two connecting segments. The default value is the array 1, 1, which means the end gen will take one second to travel from 0 to 1, and another second to travel from 1 back to 0. The default value for curve is the symbol lin, which means the end gen will linearly interpolate between level points. If you scroll down, you can see the other options for curve, but for now, 
Let's hear the default env.new in action. Triangle envelopes are all well and good, but let's provide our own arguments for env.new. We'll start by changing the levels array. The envelope will start at 0, rise to 1, fall to 0.2, and then fall all the way back to 0 from 0.2. Since there are now four level points, I'll need three durations in the second array. I'll use 0.5, 1, and 2 seconds. I'll leave the curve argument alone for now and plot the env so that we can see that we have four level values with linear interpolation with durations equal to 0.5, 1, and 2 seconds. Suppose we want exponential interpolation. Changing lin to exp in this example won't work, as I mentioned earlier, since you can't interpolate exponentially when 0 is part of the output range. So to use exp, we'd have to change 0 to a very small positive number. But a more flexible option is to use a third array of numbers to specify segment curvatures. Positive values make the segment change slowly at first, then quickly, while negative values make the segment change quickly at first and then level off. The size of this array should be equal to the size of the second array since we need one curvature for each breakpoint segment. In this example, the first curvature value is positive, so the first segment changes slowly, then quickly. The second segment has a negative curvature, so it changes quickly and then levels off. The farther away from zero the curvature values get, the more extreme the curvature will be. If we reverse the first two curve values, we can see that now the first segment changes quickly, then levels off, while the second segment changes slowly, then drops more quickly. We can even replace individual numbers with valid symbols, like this. Let's hear one of our custom envelopes in action. I'll now move on to EnvGen's second argument, gate. In the case of fixed length envelopes, such as the one we've been dealing with, gate can be used as a trigger, which will reset the envelope. To re-trigger the envelope, gate must change from a non-positive value to a positive value. Generally, it's a good idea to just use 0 and 1. Notice in the EnvGen help file that gate's default argument is 1, but I'm overwriting it with a value of 0. So the synth has been created, but the envelope hasn't been triggered yet. All we need to do is set gate equal to 1. As I said, a trigger occurs when the value changes from non-positive to positive. Therefore, evaluating this line again won't do anything, since gate has already been set to 1. So, one option is to set gate back to 0, and then set it to 1 again to re-trigger. But it's kind of stupid to do this manually, which is why there's a special trigger argument to take care of this kind of thing. To create a trigger argument, all you have to do is precede a normal argument with t underscore. t underscore arguments, according to the synthdef help file, will be made as a trig control. Setting the argument will create a control rate impulse at the set value. This means that if you set t gate equal to 1, it will automatically return to 0 in the next control cycle, or approximately 64 samples later. This means we can re-trigger the envelope in a more intuitive way, like this. Maybe we want our synth to trigger its envelope as soon as we create it. In this case, it makes more sense to set gate's default argument to 1 instead of 0. And of course, the envelope is still re-triggerable. It's important to use the correct done action when dealing with a re-triggerable envelope. In this case, if we use done action 2, then the envelope will be re-triggerable so long as it does not reach the end.
If the envelope is allowed to finish, then the synth will free itself and will no longer be available, as we can see from the message in the post window. When using done action 0, once the envelope finishes, it will output its last value until it is retriggered, and the synth will remain on the server until we free it. If you want a fixed length envelope to be retriggerable, it's best to use done action 0 and to retrigger using a t underscore argument. If you want a one shot sound with a fixed length envelope, it's better to use done action 2 and to create multiple synths. It all depends on the nature of the sound you're trying to make. The last thing I'll discuss in this tutorial is the ADSR envelope. We've looked at env.new, but there's also env.adsr. ADSR stands for Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release. The fundamental difference between ADSR and the previous examples is that ADSR has a sustain portion, which means it can be sustained indefinitely as long as the gate argument remains positive. Here, I'll just use the default values, but if you've been following this series so far, you should have no problem putting in your own values for ADSR. Here, gate is zero by default, so all we have to do is open the gate to trigger the ADSR envelope. There's a quick attack to an amplitude of 1, and a 0.3 second decay to a sustained amplitude of 0.5. The sound will sit at this level until the gate is set to 0, which will trigger a 1 second release. Because there's no done action 2, the synth is still on the server, so it can be retriggered. Notice that it makes less sense to use a t underscore argument for a gate when dealing with a sustainable envelope. If we were to use a trigger argument, then as soon as the envelope is triggered, t gate will almost immediately return to zero, which will trigger the release phase of the ADSR envelope. So with t underscore gate and an ADSR envelope, there's actually no way to sustain the sound. Therefore, it's better to use a normal gate argument for sustaining envelopes. And of course, if we use done action 2, then the synth will be removed after the envelope finishes. Last, here's an example of using a second ADSR envelope to control the frequency modulation of the oscillator sound source. I'll make use of NGEN's third and fourth arguments, level scale and level bias, which are almost exactly like mull and add. I'll increase the attack time of the frequency control so that the effect is a little bit more audible. And also, since these two envelopes share the same gate argument and the same release time, they will end simultaneously, so it doesn't matter which envelope has done action 2. In the env help file, you can find many other class methods in addition to .new and .adsr. For fixed duration envelopes, there's a triangle shape, a sinusoid shape, a percussive shape, and some others. And for sustained envelopes, there's also DADSR, which has an initial delay time, and ASR, which does not have a decay segment. EnvGen, especially considering its combination with Env, is a pretty deep UGen with a lot of potential that I haven't discussed in this video. But hopefully, this material is enough to clarify the basic concepts. That's it for tutorial number four. In the next video, I'll talk about multi-channel expansion, which is an incredibly powerful and convenient shortcut for creating rich and complex sounds. If you've been enjoying this series so far, please consider giving a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.